Ambulance emergency, what town or suburb? I'm on board a boat, I'm on a heart attack. They are an Australian icon, but these flying doctors are Brits. Two-two-year-old male, pelvis injuries, will be with you in five. He's got a positive path, he needs to go straight to the operating theatre. Hundreds of medics from the NHS are saving lives down under. It's all a bit scary, isn't it, but she's doing great. Many are flown into action by British pilots. It's a great feeling of satisfaction. Then you can actually say at the end of the day, you actually saved somebody's life. Wave a gazette, wave a gazette. And some are bringing back home skills learned on the cutting edge of outback medicine. Start with the thoracostomy on this side. Yep. Can you just cycle another blood pressure, please? Today, down under, a paraglider crashes and Dr. Chris flies to his rescue. Yeah, just uh, drift in the water. Ulsterman Tim is fighting to save the life of his patient in mid-air. Got a theater organized. He's got a positive path. He needs to go straight to the operating theater. Sorry. And the tricky case of three Brits and a baby. Any problems from the pregnancy point of view? The golden beaches around Sydney are a playground for anyone who loves sunbathing, swimming or surfing. But this coastline has a lethal attraction for another group of visitors. This is paragliding heaven. Northeasterly winds blowing in from the sea and onto the cliffs provide updrafts that can keep pilots in the air all day. Oh, the freedom. It's a great view out there, great fun, flying with mates. Best fun you can have sitting down. But this isn't known as one of the world's most dangerous extreme sports for nothing. And when the wind drops towards nightfall, the coastline is a dangerous place to be airborne, as flying doctor Chris Cheeseman is about to find out. Air medical control, camp line four, we've departed. West Beach base five TOB, heading for Stanwall Park. ETA, possibly 15 minutes. We don't know very much at all. Hang glider and it's uh, gone off a cliff and uh, had an impact on the beach by the sound of it on some rocks. Um, Stanford Park's a very popular area for hang gliders. We'll sort of and see and see what we find when we get there. Flying on missions like this is the reason Chris gave up his job in the NHS in Staffordshire and came down under. Be flying around Sydney and over the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House is just absolutely fabulous. The fact that you work in a very, very small, compact team is all part and parcel of the benefit of working on the helicopters. Got a helicopter traffic, four o'clock, moving away from us. The light's fading fast, but at last there's good news. The patient is conscious, exhausted, been in the water for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, we're just going to go down and assess him, so just keep other resources coming our one until we get back to Southern Operations, Care 54, copy that uh, transmission. We're approximately two minutes till overhead and uh, we'll monitor the channel. Happy to uh, continue. And the carriage is down, park brakes on, as we'll walk to three grades. Okay, let's go in here. The team's heading for a touchdown in a cliff top park. Sand can damage helicopter engines, so the beach is second best. Do you want to go parallel with that uh, cabana? I think so, somewhere about. Clear of the wires. The pilot was in the sea for 15 minutes or more. He's lucky. Pilots have drowned after becoming entangled in their chutes. Cut himself out, cut the rope. After he landed? After he landed yep. in the water. Got himself out. He's not a very strong swimmer, so he's in the water for probably 15 to 20 minutes, struggling underneath the surf. You remember what happened to you then? Yeah, just uh, drift in the water. Yeah, okay mate. You didn't knock yourself out? No. I'm just pushing down the back of your neck here. Is there any pain there at all? No. no. The sea temperature at this time of year off Sydney is 20 degrees Celsius. This man could have survived four hours or more. But the chilling effects of air on wet clothing mean that now he's been rescued, he's at real risk of hypothermia. He's landed in a nice position, nice soft water. 
So he's landed not far from here, just up north, where he could have just uh, landed on the rock, so it could have been a lot worse for him. He's quite hypothermic, so our main plan is to give him a quick assessment, make sure there's nothing clinically we have to treat, and warming him up, and the best way to do that, since he's fine, is to walk him, cover him with blankets, and he's gonna generate his own heat while walking back, and it saves us doing an injury on the way. Paragliders frequently suffer back and leg injuries when they crash. Ditching in seawater has different but equally lethal hazards. Even though we've started the uh, passive warming process, the wet clothing is still going to drag the heat and the energy out of his body, so we're removing his clothing and giving him a disposable paper suit and then putting the warming gear back on him again and making sure that we keep his core temperature at a nice temperature around about 36 and a half degrees. So when he arrives at hospital, he's uh, warm, happy and healthy. This man's likely to have some explaining to do before he's allowed to fly again. I'm with your husband. He's had a bit of a paragliding accident. OK? But he's all OK. Yeah, he's, he's just in the ambulance next to me. I'll, his phone doesn't work because he got dumped in the sea. So his phone doesn't work. He's, he's, he's OK, love, all right? He's, he's not badly injured at all. Reassuring partners is all in a day's work for a flying doctor. Got some cuts and grazes and bruises to his lower leg, but other than that, he seemed pretty OK. Uh, lucky escape, he had a soft landing, I guess, didn't he? Please go straight I'll go straight up. It's time for Care Flight 4 to head back to base. Night falls fast in Australia, and this takeoff will be a challenge for the pilot, even with the aid of a flashlight. The patient's going to hospital by road. It'll be easier to warm him up in a ground ambulance. And for flying Dr. Chris and the team, the flight back to base is another opportunity to savour the Sydney skyline. showers and the chance of an afternoon thunderstorm mainly in the west. Temperature again today up to the high 20s, mid 30s range. More news in a quarter to it. Australia welcomes 190,000 new residents each year, more than the population of Portsmouth. And it's easy to see why they come. Where else can you spend the morning shopping in the nation's biggest city and the afternoon on the beach? It's the weather and the lifestyle that brings most of them. Yeah, one of those on a uh, flat white, thanks. Yeah. And Dr. Tim Stewart's no exception. I'm originally from Belfast. I made a conscious decision that I wanted to try life in Australia. People ask me all the time, why was it you moved to Australia? What is it about Australia that you like so much? And I think it just all boils down to climate. Dr. Tim found his medical qualifications in big demand down under. He did have to work on his bedside manner, though. I guess the patients probably aren't expecting to hear my accent, and occasionally I do have to repeat myself. Um, but on the other hand, I think you'll find that the hospitals are full of uh, expats from the UK and Ireland. We're just checking to see how we're going to get there. Either, we'll do it either way, obviously. But, um... Just about the wind and stuff like that, so. Today, Dr. Tim's one of two flying doctors covering almost a quarter of a million square miles of New South Wales from the Ambulance Service Airbase at Wollongong. Uh, yeah, here we go again. There's a motorcyclist uh, in quite a remote area who's um, come off his motorbike. Um, altered level of consciousness, blood coming from his mouth, and that's about all we know at the moment. So it's about half an hour away by air. Go and check it out. 149 degrees east. Yep. 52 minutes. Dr. Tim's patient is lying in remote scrubland, 115 miles from Sydney. Even at 170 miles an hour, it'll be a long flight. It's the equivalent of flying from London to Birmingham. Departed Wollongong base proceeding to Bungonia for the motorcycle accident. We have five POB. ETA to Bungonia time 17.20. Rescue 26 is equipped with the latest communications gear, from satellite phone to data downlinking. 
But out in the wastes of the Vangonia National Park, much of it is useless. Should we try the, respond, the first responder again? The same thing, very limited comps. Tim's job is a lonely one. The patient's life will depend on his medical skills with little of the backup he'd have in A&E. Mental preparation is essential. We're thinking about potential issues with the patient, the injuries that the patient has and the complications that the patient might have from those injuries, what equipment we might need to use, which would include an ultrasound machine and some blood. It's in the 9 o'clock, just on the bench, mate. Roger. Right, yeah. Coming around to the 10 now. All right, let's look for the best little LZ, Scotty, as close as we can. I reckon uh, just down near that tree, yeah. the dirt road. Yeah, I'm here now. I'll do a little bit of a recce of that. All Dr. Tim knows is that his patient is badly injured and in the care of a local paramedic. This is wild Australia. The nearest town has a population of 250 and it's 40 miles away. The chopper's touching down at a grid reference in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, Southern Control, Rescue 26, uh, landed uh, roadside bunker. The patient's a 10 pound POM, a Brit from the Midlands who moved down under 30 years ago. It's come a grief down here on some bends, yep. bikes wedged in under the guardrail. Right Biker yeah, Phil Belcher good. crashed at high speed. He's a broken arm and he's confused. It looks like a routine case for Dr. Tim. Have you any pain when you take a deep breath? In your belly. That's all. In your belly? Yeah. Which Are you sore here? Not really. No. What about we'll when I squeeze you there? Is that sore? No. no. Okay. It is April Fool's Day, but this is no joke, is it? He's using a miniature ultrasound machine to look for internal injuries. Yeah, a little bit uncomfortable. Just bear with me for a few seconds. I got a positive fast. Free fluid blood in the abdomen. So we need to get him out. His abdomen is full of blood. He's bleeding internally. I can't get a decent cardiac window. Um, so I can try again in the aircraft, but the priority at the moment is to get yeah, him to the hospital. Cool. Yeah. I want to get a blood pressure before we get in because I've got no radial pulse. Phil is becoming more confused. His blood pressure is dropping and so is the oxygen saturation in his blood. Just relax mm. your head, Phil. You've got to keep it straight, buddy. Other issues, bleeding, abdomen, yeah. hemodynamically stable at the moment, GCS 15. It's really just from an mm. airway yeah. protection point of view. Hospital is half an hour away. Tim wants to get Phil to a CT scanner. If he was in my emergency department, yeah. I'd be tubing him for a scan, I think. Yeah. Um, so he's going to need tube once he gets there. Yeah. It'd be quicker for us to do it now than to wait for the emergency department to do it. Right. He's going to put Phil into an induced coma. He's done this before in hospital, but this yeah. is the middle of the bush. It's a delicate procedure and not without risk. We've practiced it in training, um, but that was my first one in real life. Um, and there's always got to be a first time. We had run through our checklist and we knew exactly what was going to be our plan B and our plan C if things didn't work out first time. As Rescue 26 takes off for hospital in Sydney, Phil's blood pressure is continuing to fall. So, Monty, we should um, tell them to get the mass transfusion and get a theatre organised. He's got a positive bath. He needs to go straight to the operating theatre. OK, we've got a 60-year-old male motorcyclist. He's had 1.5 litres of fluid. He's also had three bags of uh, fresh blood. They've given him a transfusion and saline, but it's not enough. Dr. Tim fears his patient may not make it, and he's still 20 minutes from intensive care. Rescue 26 is flying north towards the bright lights of the city. His 
blood pressure was dangerously low in the back of the helicopter, and there was a couple of times there whenever I thought that he was going to die in front of me. They had a team assembled, and they expedited his transfer to theatre, and he was out of the emergency department within about five minutes. I mean, they confirmed what I saw on their ultrasound, belly full of blood, uh, unstable, low blood pressure. It's a no-brainer. He goes straight to theatre and that was facilitated, so very slick. For several days, Phil hovers between life and death in the Liverpool hospital. He's lost three and a half litres of blood. His spleen is removed and his family is warned he may not survive. Then he starts to improve and within a month, he's allowed home. It was a beautiful day and I was probably enjoying the ride so much that I must have gone round the corner and just looking at the view and, the, and my, it must have hit some gravel or something happened and I don't know anything more after that. All I can say is thank you, which is not enough. Phil grew up in the black country and emigrated to Australia in the late 70s. He collects classic British bikes, which are even more popular down under than they are at home. But his days on two wheels are now behind him. I didn't think I was going to make it, and the things that happened to me, I can only say what other people have told me. And from that time, I thought, well, I can't put my relatives and friends and everyone through all this again. Well, I'm just going to take it more gentle and no more riding motorbikes, no more putting people through the trauma that I've done. The number of British medics working in Australia has doubled in less than 10 years. It's reckoned more than 400 doctors from the NHS are working down under. And today at the base of NETS, the specialist team that transfers sick babies and children from local hospitals into units in Sydney, the medical brain drain is obvious. We're an all British team today. There's me, I'm proud and Adrian. We're going for a young child that has had a persistently low blood sugar since birth and um, they have done some tests and it is showing that the baby is producing too much insulin. Nurse Tanya from Rochdale in Lancashire has plenty to talk about with Dr Pradeep from nearby Preston. I hate this mask. I have to change it. Even paramedic driver Adrian's a Brit. He's from Birmingham. Car 15 departing for Gosford at M14. The helicopter is grounded for servicing, so today the team is going by road. A newborn baby in Gosford, 50 miles from Sydney, has a very low blood sugar level. It's a potentially dangerous condition. If the family are around, then we'll want to speak to the family and just let them know and brief them what we plan to do at each stage. The last thing we want to do is actually leave them in a lurch or to leave them at the side while we're actually doing a lot of interventions for the child and for them to actually feel as if they're not actually part or involved with the, the actual management. Low sugar levels have been connected to learning difficulties in later life. Was there any, any problems from the pregnancy point no, of view? Pregnancy, so no, healthy diabetes, no diabetes. There's no stress in labour. There's no spontaneous. spontaneous. Dr Pradeep knows this could be a tricky case. Staff at Gosford Hospital have been giving little Zali Parsons glucose directly into her veins, but with little success. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a look at her. Um, we'll check her oh, sugar again yes. in a little while, because I just believe she's had another lowish one, hasn't she? Oh, I know, it's cool. And uh, they've started on that special medication that will help bring up the sugar. Yeah. Zali's mum, Tegan, comes from a Welsh family that emigrated to Australia in the 70s. Pradeep's trying to reassure her, but she's naturally concerned. So you'll find ourselves doing a lot of things. One is monitoring, um, and the other is actually just making sure that everything is perfectly fine, because the last thing we want to do is to actually create a problem or try to solve a problem en route, which yeah. can be solved before. At last, Zali's responding to treatment. The sugar is only just slowly creeping up, but not as much as one would expect. To err on the side of caution, it's always nicer to get more than two results, you know, which is in the good range. Oh, sorry. Let's go and have a look. What if we don't wear your tummy? There you go. It's time to hit the road. 
It's less than an hour's drive to Sydney's main children's hospital. But for Pradeep and the team, it will be a tense journey. Fund action is basically a blood sugar level um, at one hour. If it's above three, perfectly fine. If, however, that's abnormal, then we'll have to repeat the blood sugar level after half an hour and then tinkle along with the infusions. The Sydney rush hour is among the slowest in the world, and it's underway. In the back of the Nets ambulance, the team is constantly monitoring Zani's condition. It's just been about an hour since the last blood sugar, so we're um, just going to check another one, make sure it's OK. Uh, so we've just pulled over safely, because we need to be out of seatbelts, and um, we don't like being out of seatbelts in traffic. OK, Danny. Well done. 3.8. We're happy with that. Yeah, that's good again. Um, that means that we don't have to fill around with any of the infusions and we don't have to repeat the blood sugar again for another hour. At last, Zali's arriving at the children's hospital. The team's tiny patient will be going straight into the high dependency unit. Once again, she'll be in the hands of NHS expats. This hospital recruits large numbers of doctors and nurses from the UK, like Tanya. The health system in New South Wales, I don't think we're riding very well without the Brits. <laughs> there you go, gorgeous. Hello. The plan here now is we're just going to put a central line in, so if she needs any more sugar, they can give her a higher concentration. It's going to be a worrying 24 hours for her mum but specialists soon managed to raise Zali's blood sugar level. <laughs> and within a few days, she's back home in the Sydney suburbs, showing no signs of the problems associated with her very rare condition. They couldn't do anything at Gosford. They needed her down with the specialists and the special team that could get her back to where she is, otherwise she might not be home yet. Her mum's very grateful to the all-British team for arranging Zali's life-saving sugar rush. It doesn't bother me, my family's Welsh, so <laughs> I don't have a problem with it at all and I love the accents. And Zali's already showing signs of putting her health crisis behind her. She's healthy, she's putting on weight, she's happy, and I'm just glad she's home. Today at them breakfast. You're feeling good. You're feeling right. Jules, Merrick and Sophie. Today at them breakfast. I'm, I'm, I'm here. One in four Australians is born abroad, many in the UK. But around a third of Brits fail to settle down under and return within five years. Many blame homesickness, separation from family or failure to make friends. Building a new life here isn't always easy. Kevin Ratcliffe's had to do it. He left the West Country and a career as a naval officer to fly the rescue chopper based at Newcastle, 100 miles north of Sydney. The adaptation process, I think, has sort of been, I think, quite sort of gentle and relatively easy. Perhaps being married to an Australian often helps. I think that they put up with the idea of perhaps a pommy arriving fresh straight off the boat. We're just about to um, get airborne to go up to um, the John Hunter Hospital, which is all of uh, two or three minutes flight time. Newcastle Trevor, kind of got a Westpac 2, is about to become airborne from the Newcastle Westpac base. On climb, not above 1,200 for the John Hunter Hospital, Newcastle. Coming up. We're then picking up uh, what we call a retrieval team, in other words, a doctor and a nurse, uh, and we'll be taking them up to a place called Scone, where we're going to be picking up a six-year-old six um, who's suffering from severe asthma. Basically a sort of inter-hospital transfer is what we're doing. Probably about a 40 minute flight time, heading sort of northwestwards up the Hunter Valley from where we are in Newcastle. For Kevin, moving to Australia has meant adapting to a whole new culture and language. OK, so you sit in the rear? We are, yeah. Yeah, we're good. I'll just tighten as we go. Was that a, you're still working on it, Danita, or are you nearly there? No, I'm good. Oh, excellent. Right, coming up. Got a hot mark in the back there, guys. Yep. You sometimes joke about the idea of two people separated by a common language. Yeah, thanks. Westpac 2 is airborne, John Hunter. 5 POB on a medical retrieval to Scone Hospital. ETA there, 1320, 1320. You lose a little bit of the 
the pure Englishness of the way that you speak and then capture a little bit of the, the local lingo. He's at the same height, two miles in front of us. That might be Kiel Oscar Foxtrot, although I'm expecting it to be over there a bit further. Uh, there's one on your right, going over on your right, going down. Oh, yeah, got him, yeah, got him. Yep, that's yeah, probably Kiel Oscar Brits are a common target of Aussie humour. Yeah, the window's dirty. Yeah, well, if you wouldn't mind just stepping up with your chamois. Right on. We were just in the middle of a battle watching. They really enjoy a little bit of light-hearted banter. It tends to lighten the day and make life a little bit easier. I think that the Australians love the idea that Pommies, by definition, are whingers. Aussies love to try and have a little bit of an edge on the Poms because it's a little bit of one upmanship. Hey, I have got some links to the UK. My mother's great-grandparents were both convicts. You are uh, a royalty then. The great-grandfather, whoever he was, stole a sheep, and the wife stole some linen. She was a housekeeper for somebody. So, so fairly yeah. substantial crime. All of a sudden, you know, they're feeling like they've got the upper hand, and so I think you can play the game a little bit, and it's all's well. Wow, we've got nothing to fear from you then, have we, Tanita? <laughs> nothing at all. This 40-minute flight will save an ambulance crew an entire day's work. That's how long it would have taken to make the return journey by road. And humour makes long flights seem shorter. Yeah, lots of banter, which is good, you know, it's a lot of fun and it keeps it light light-hearted in the aircraft. The chopper is partly paid for by charity, so Kevin often finds himself the crew's public relations man. Yes. Yeah, he's a worry. I've not seen it before. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that is important to us, of course, is a bit of community engagement because we are a charity and, of course, our fundraising in the Hunter Valley is, is a fundamental part of what we do uh, and how we can afford to be able to do what we do. The team's patient is six-year-old Hugo Firth. He's been driven from the local cottage hospital with his mum and dad. He has had a, um, an asthma attack uh, early this morning, it's just really short on his breath. He um, said I was going really a bit blue in the colour and, and had a vomit and not, not so well. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, poor little fella. So this is what we've got to do and make him safe. Yeah, get better. One, two, three, lift. For all the smiles, this is a serious case. Asthma can kill. Hugo's on his way to specialist treatment in Newcastle. Rescue helicopter Heath speaking. Hello Heath, this is Michael on board helicopter Westpac 2. We're on our way back, we're only landing at the John, just past 1500, we'll be back with you about 1510. Okay mate, we'll see you then. The sheer size of Australia puts patients like Hugo at much greater risk than they'd face in the UK. He's just been flown to the nearest children's hospital to his home in the Hunter Valley. Yet that involved a 90-mile trip. Hugo makes a good recovery and soon heads home. For Kevin, it's the end of another day as an adopted Aussie. And he can't see himself returning to the UK. I don't think that I'm at all regretting the move. So long as you approach it in the right way, it's really easy to sort of fit in and to settle in. I think the longer I stay, the harder it is for me to believe that I could go back and slot back in again um, because it becomes easier and easier for me to sort of stay right where I am. And when you can save lives in blue skies like this, it's perhaps little wonder few British pilots choose to head home until their flying days are over. have to work on his bedside manner though. I guess the patients probably aren't expecting to hear my accent and occasionally I do have to repeat myself. 
Um, but on the other hand, I think you'll find that the hospitals are full of uh, expats from the UK and Ireland. We're just checking to see how we're going to get there. Either, we'll do it either way, obviously. Um, just about the wind and stuff like that. So. Today, Dr. Tim's one of two flying doctors covering almost a quarter of a million square miles of New South Wales from the Ambulance Service Airbase at Wollongong. Uh, yeah, here we go again. There's a motorcyclist uh, in quite a remote area who's um, come off his motorbike. Um, altered level of consciousness, blood coming from his mouth, and that's about all we know at the moment. So it's about half an hour away by air. Go and check it out. 149 degrees east. Yep. 52 minutes. Dr. Tim's patient is lying in remote scrubland 115 miles from Sydney. Even at 170 miles an hour, it'll be a long flight. It's the equivalent of flying from London to Birmingham. Think you departed Wollongong base proceeding to Bungonia for the motorcycle accident. We have five POV. ETA to Bungonia time 17.20. Risk. A young child that has had a persistently low blood sugar since birth and um, they have done some tests and it is showing that the baby is producing too much insulin. Nurse Tanya from Rochdale in Lancashire has plenty to talk about with Dr Pradeep from nearby Preston. I hate this mask. I have to change it. Even paramedic driver Adrian's a Brit. He's from Birmingham. Oh, 15, the the helicopter is grounded for servicing, so today the team is going by road. A newborn baby in Gosford, 50 miles from Sydney, has a very low blood sugar level. It's a potentially dangerous condition. If the family are around, then we'll want to speak to the family and just let them know and brief them what we plan to do at each stage. The last thing we want to do is actually leave them in a lurch or to leave them at the side while we're actually doing a lot of interventions for the child and for them to actually feel as if they're not actually part or involved with the, the actual management. Low sugar levels have been connected to learning difficulties in later life. Was there any, any problems from the pregnancy point no, of view? No, it's a healthy pregnancy, no diabetes. No diabetes. There was no stress on my event, it's spontaneous. Dr. Pradeep knows this could be a tricky case. Staff at Gosford Hospital have been giving little Zali Parsons glucose directly into her veins, but with little success. So what are we going to do? We've started the uh, passive warming process. The wet clothing is still going to drag the heat and the energy out of his body, so we're removing his clothing and giving him a disposable paper suit and then putting the warming gear back on him again and making sure that we keep his core temperature at a nice temperature around about 36 and a half degrees. So when he arrives at hospital, he's uh, warm, happy and healthy. This man's likely to have some explaining to do before he's allowed to fly again. I'm with your husband. He's had a bit of a paragliding accident. OK? But he's all OK. Yeah, he's just in the ambulance next to me. I'll, his phone doesn't work because he got dumped in the sea. So his phone doesn't work. He's, he's, he's OK, love, all right? He's, he's not badly injured at all. Reassuring partners is all in a day's work for a flying doctor. Got some cuts and grazes and bruises to his lower leg, but other than that, he seemed pretty OK. Uh, lucky escape. He had a soft landing, I guess, didn't he? Please, go straight I'll go straight up. It's time for Care Flight 4 to head back to base. And lifting. Night falls fast in Australia, and this takeoff will be a challenge for the pilot, even with the aid of a flashlight. Straight up for the moment. The patient's going to hospital by road. It'll be easier to warm him up in a ground ambulance. Male motorcyclist. He's had 1.5 litres of fluid. He's also had three bags of uh, fresh blood. They've given him a transfusion and saline, but it's not enough. Dr. Tim fears his patient may not make it, and he's still 20 minutes from intensive care. Rescue 26 is flying north towards the bright lights of the city. It's 
blood pressure was dangerously low in the back of the helicopter and there was a couple of times there whenever I thought that he was going to die in front of me. They had a team assembled and they expedited his transfer to theatre and he was out of the emergency department within about five minutes. I mean, they confirmed what I saw on their ultrasound, belly full of blood, uh, unstable, low blood pressure. It's a no-brainer. He goes straight to theatre and that was facilitated, so very slick. For several days, Phil hovers between life and death in the Liverpool hospital. He's lost three and a half litres of blood. His spleen is removed and his family is warned he may not survive. Then he starts to improve and within a month he's allowed home. It was a beautiful day and I was probably enjoying the rock. Rescue 26 is equipped with the latest communications gear from satellite phone to data downlinking. But out in the wastes of the Bungonia National Park, much of it is useless. Should we try the, respond the first responder again? The same thing, very limited comps. Tim's job is a lonely one. The patient's life will depend on his medical skills with little of the backup he'd have in A&E. Mental preparation is essential. We're thinking about potential issues with the patient, the injuries that the patient has and the complications that the patient might have from those injuries, what equipment we might need to use, which would include an ultrasound machine and some blood. It's in the 9 o'clock, just on the bench, mate. All right, yeah. We're coming around to the 10 now. All right, let's look for the best little LZ, Scotty, as close as we can. I reckon uh, just down near that tree, yeah. it's the dirt road. Yeah, I'm here now. I'll do a little bit of a recce of that. All Dr. Tim knows is that his patient is badly injured and in the care of a local paramedic. This is wild Australia. The nearest town has a population of 250 and it's 40 miles away. The chopper's touching down at a grid reference in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, Southern Control, Rescue 26, uh, landed uh, roadside bunker. The patients are 10 pounds. Australia that you like so much, and I think it just all boils down to climate. Dr. Tim found his medical qualifications in big demand down under. He did have to work on his bedside manner, though. I guess the patients probably aren't expecting to hear my accent and occasionally I do have to repeat myself. Um, but on the other hand, I think you'll find that the hospitals are full of uh, expats from the UK and Ireland. We're just checking to see how we're going to get there. We'll, either, we'll do it either way, obviously. Um, just about the wind and stuff like that. So. Today, Dr. Tim's one of two flying doctors covering almost a quarter of a million square miles of New South Wales from the Ambulance Service Airbase at Wollongong. Uh, yeah, here we go again. There's a motorcyclist uh, in quite a remote area who's um, come off his motorbike. Um, altered level of consciousness, blood coming from his mouth, and that's about all we know at the moment. So it's about half an hour away by air. Go and check it out. 149 degrees east. Yep. 52 minutes. Dr. Tim's patient is lying in remote scrubland 115 miles from Sydney. Even at 170 miles an hour, it'll be a long flight. It's the equivalent of flying from London to Birmingham. Departed, have drowned after becoming entangled in their chutes. Cut himself out, cut the rope. After he landed. After he landed yep. in the water got himself out. He's not a very strong swimmer, so he's in the water for probably 15 to 20 minutes struggling underneath the surf. You remember what happened to you then? Yeah, just uh, just in the water. Yeah, okay mate. You didn't knock yourself out? No. no I'm just pushing down the back of your neck here. Is there any pain there at all? No. no. The sea temperature at this time of year off Sydney is 20 degrees Celsius. This man could have survived four hours or more. But the chilling effects of air on wet clothing mean that now he's been rescued, he's at real risk of hypothermia. He's landed in a nice position, nice soft water. So he's landed not far from here, just up north, where he could have just uh, landed on the rock, so it could have been a lot worse for him. He's quite hypothermic, so our main plan is to give him a quick assessment, make sure there's nothing clinically we have to treat. And warming him up, and the best way to do that, since he's fine, is to walk him, cover him with blankets, 
and he's going to generate his own heat while walking back and it saves us doing an injury on the way. Paragliders frequently suffer back and leg injuries when they crash. Ditching in seawater has different but equally lethal hazards. Even though we've started the uh, passive warming process, the wet clothing is still going to drag the heat and the energy out of his body, so we're removing his clothing and giving him a disposable paper suit and then putting the warming him a disposable paper suit and then putting the warming gear back on him again and making sure that we keep his core temperature at a nice temperature around about 36 and a half degrees. So when he arrives at hospital, he's uh, warm, happy and healthy. This man's likely to have some explaining to do before he's allowed to fly again. I'm with your husband. He's had a bit of a paragliding accident. OK, but he's all OK. Yeah, he's, he's just in the ambulance next to me. I'll, his phone doesn't work because he got dumped in the sea. So his phone doesn't work. He's, he's, he's OK, love, all right? He's, he's not badly injured at all. Reassuring partners is all in a day's work for a flying doctor. Got some cuts and grazes and bruises to his lower leg, but other than that, he seemed pretty OK. Uh, lucky escape. He had a soft landing, I guess, didn't he? It's time for Care Flight 4 to head back to base. Night falls fast in Australia, and this takeoff will be a challenge for the pilot, even with the aid of a flashlight. The patient's going to hospital by road. It'll be easier to warm him up in a ground ambulance. And for flying Dr. Chris and the team, the flight back to base is another opportunity to savour the Sydney